Welcome to the second video in this series on Vatican propaganda in their quest for Roman primacy. The first video detailed the rise of the Miss of Peter as the first bishop of Rome and how this came to be used in the arguments for papal primacy. This video will present how later popes began to exert political influence over the city of Rome and then go on to claim supremacy over the emperors. Following Constantine's reunification, the empire would fragment again into eastern and western halves following the death of Theodosius I in 395. The western capital did not return to Rome from Milan, where it was Maximian's capital under the Tetrarchy, but went instead to Ravenna in northeast Italy by 402. The emperor no longer resided in Rome, but the city was still administered by the Senate, some of whose families had converted to Christianity, and the bishopric of Rome remained a position of marginal importance. However, that was about to change. Moving the center of power out of Rome had set the stage for the later bishops of Rome to take on increasingly more direct roles in governing the city and surrounding lands, which gave them the opportunity to flex their authority both political and spiritual. Following the claim of Pope Damasus in 381 to have an unbroken succession from Peter, we next move to Pope Leo I, known as the Great. Leo was pope from 440 to 61, during this time of the declining power of Rome, shortly before the last western emperor was deposed in 476. It was during Leo's reign that a pope first took a significant role in civic affairs, the negotiations with Attila the Hun to depart and spare Rome in 452. Leo also took major steps in advancing the arguments for Roman primacy. Leo provides the oldest surviving assertion of Petrine privilege over other bishops in Sicily in a letter sent in 447 in which he seeks to instruct them. In another letter to Bishop Hilary of Arles, Leo used his assumed Roman privilege to intervene in Gaul and instruct Hilary about his own attempts to overstep his authority and meddle in the affairs of the Diocese of Vienne. Democopolis notes that these letters are examples of the start of the expansion of Roman influence via the rhetoric of the Petrine narrative for papal authority, and that they demonstrate the degree of uncertainty with which Leo's assertions were met. In the letter to Hilary, Leo implies that his authority is ignored by the bishops who do not accept it, and as such they are evidence that papal claims to authority reflect Leo's desires and not reality. One major victory occurred early in Leo's papacy, when he petitioned and won from the Western Emperor a declaration of Roman primacy in 445. Given that the empire had split into two again, the proclamation only had legitimacy over bishops in churches in the western half, but the emperor nonetheless had declared that the churches in the west were to be obedient to the Roman bishop. The next pope to take lasting moves toward papal supremacy, not just over the bishops, but over the emperors and secular power, was Gelasius, who was in office from 492 to 96. Like Leo, Democopolis notes that the proclamations Gelasius uttered were not based in either reality or made from a position of strength, but his posturing exhibits all the hallmarks of an impotent man with little tangible authority, both in Italy and in the East. Further, Democopolis writes that Gelasius was also not respected by the Roman Senate or by many of his own clerics. Gelasius made several attempts to declare and assert the primacy of Rome over the whole church. Not content with simply religious primacy, in a display of breathtaking audacity, Gelasius made the first overt call for the church's supremacy over the state in religious matters. This Gelasian doctrine declared that the church and its princes are superior to merely temporal rulers. Known as the Doctrine of Two Powers, and by various other titles, the Wikipedia name is shown on screen, such as Duo Sunt, or There Are Two, the Ad Anastasium, or Epistle 12, originates from the letter written in 494 to the Eastern Emperor Anastasius I Decorus. There are three interesting aspects of the letter to note. 1. Setting doctrine is a matter for the Church, and not what emperors wish. 2. The Pope recognizes that emperors have superiority in civic matters, and three, the Bishop of Rome derives his power from Peter, and no ecumenical council called by an emperor subordinate to a pope can weaken their superiority through canons granting equivalent status to other bishops. Recall from the previous video where the Council of Constantinople elevated the bishop of that city. All of these points were made in the context over who had the authority in determining church issues of the day. As they were not secular matters, it should be left in the capable hands of the one most able to decide, the most high-ordained above all others. 
Gelasius subtly inserts himself between the divine and the emperor, insisting the pope will be held accountable before God for the emperor's performance in discharging his secular duties, and consequently Gelasius has a higher responsibility. Further, Gelasius frequently refers to the emperor as son, which casts the emperor in the subordinate role to that of the nurturing spiritual father. Democopolis notes that these kinds of statements are not reflections of the authority Gelasius had in reality, but are simply a wish list of what he wants for himself. The doctrine of two powers also laid the groundwork for the papal monarchy, which began in the mid-700s when the papal states were created. Further, it could also be argued that Gelasius was making tentative steps in formulating the concept of separation of church and state. Other letters from Gelasius demonstrate his illusions of power. In what is known as Epistle 10, Democopolis writes that Gelasius makes the most assertive claim to Roman privilege in all of late antiquity. Five of these most assertive claims are, the whole church has been entrusted to the examination of the Roman see, the Roman see ought to judge the whole church, the Roman see cannot be judged by anyone, a Roman verdict cannot be scrutinized by another see, and a Roman verdict can never be overturned by another see. Further, Epistle 26 states, the see of blessed Peter the Apostle has the right to judge the whole church, neither is it lawful for anyone to judge its judgment. Point 3 from Epistle 10, the Roman see cannot be judged by anyone, got absorbed into a forgery during a fight for the papal throne from 501 to 02 between two contending rivals for the papacy, Symmachus and Laurentius, and was used in a series of four trials that judged the supposed misdeeds of Symmachus. What are known as the Symmachian forgeries, named so because they were drafted by supporters of Symmachus, created a series of imaginary historical councils in which it was declared doctrine that popes are above the laws of man and can only be judged by God. The Catholic doctrine, the first see is judged by none, makes its first appearance in the events of the fictitious trial of Pope Marcellinus at, the council, at a council in 303. The second forgery to deal with papal accusations involved Pope Sixtus III in the early 400s where it was claimed to be illegal to pass sentence on a pope. The third forgery, the Constitutum Silvestri, which created yet another fictitious council, the Council of Sylvester, that was alleged to have taken place in 324. This council drew on the story of both Marcellinus and Sixtus, Sixtus and issued a fictitious canon, number three, known as the Accusatorial Canon that prohibited subordinates from making accusations against their superiors, like the Pope. Finally, at the Synod of Palmaris, held in October 502, the bishops followed the precedents laid out for them in the three Symmachian forgeries of Marcellinus, Sixtus, and Sylvester, and declared that as the Pope was a successor to St. Peter, the judgment must be left to God, and Symmachus was exonerated. Democopolis notes that the accusatorial canon of the Constitutum Silvestri had the benefit of shielding the Pope both from rivals within the Church and also placing him beyond the reach of secular interference. The Constitutum Silvestri and the accusatorial canon first declared by Gelasius a few years before went on to play a key role in the development of canon law, influencing how those doctrines impacted political relations, and it is still enshrined in Catholic canon law today. The next major pope to advance the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome was Gregory the Great. Gregory was the son of a senator and had been a Roman prefect, and his papacy coincided with the last days of the Roman Senate of which the last mention was made in 603 in the Gregorian Register, and by 630 Pope Honorius had the Senate House turned into a church. Into the vacuum of secular rule stepped the very able administrator. Gregory stepped into the civic void and took steps in the defense of the city, taking control of imperial garrisons, appointing officers, and paying the troops from church coffers. He also oversaw a peace deal with the Lombards separate from the Byzantine court in Ravenna, extending the Vatican's reach beyond the spiritual realm and further establishing the papacy as a force in political matters. Gregory also sent the mission that began the conversion of Britannia, in what McCulloch states was a critical turning point for the Latin Church. The shift in focus away from the East, from Byzantine imperial oversight and Greek Christians, and with the loss of North African churches to the Muslim conquest in the decades following Gregory's death, meant the papacy came to be unchallenged in Northern and Western Europe as it created a new Roman Empire, with the Church as the center. In a letter to Patriarch John in Constantinople, Gregory asserted that the Pope has the power to annul councils, and only with the consent of Rome are any issued canons valid. An interesting side note is that the Latin Church did not send any bishops to the Council of Constantinople in 381, and only sent five bishops to Nicaea, 
So Gregory's attitude is a prime example of the retroactive reimagination of Vatican influence and power that had come to pervade the papal mindset, and is representative of his belief in the primacy of the Roman See, which he thought had authority over all of Christendom. Related to Gregory's attitude of Roman primacy was his program of selectively rewriting Christian history in Western Europe in order to gloss over the Vatican's lack of importance in the early eras, and as, ha as had happened previously with the legends in the Acts of Sylvester. Increasingly alienated and isolated from the Greek East, the Pope was free to rewrite church history to demonstrate the Vatican's centrality and its role in the creation of orthodoxy, ignoring the Greek origins of the church and the role of the emperors in the councils. It is a simple fact that all of the major councils were convened by an emperor and not the bishops, and certainly not the popes, and all were held in the eastern Greek-speaking cities. That the Trinitarian status declared orthodox at Nicaea was enforced by the whim of Constantine, that it was not the majority opinion of Christian priests and bishops, and that its canonical orthodoxy wavered over time with succeeding emperors is almost wholly unknown by most modern Christians. To demonstrate just how successful the Vatican's rewriting of its history has been, in 2018, CNN aired a disgracefully biased series on the history of the papacy that was entirely lacking in any journalistic integrity and woefully short on historical facts, yet overflowing with Catholic propaganda. In The Pope, the Most Powerful Man in History, the narrator Liam Neeson regurgitated his scripted lines to spew a flagrant misrepresentation of history that entirely overlooked the early Greek history of Christianity. As Rome falls and Constantinople flourishes, much of the church's terminology becomes Greek instead of Latin. This shamefully inaccurate statement glosses over the fact that the New Testament books were all written in Greek and misses the blatantly obvious that the term for anointed or Messiah is Christos in Greek. Historian Charles Freeman writes that the political aspects of Christian doctrine had been so successfully expunged as to be virtually ignored in most Western histories, after Gregory the Great removed the emperor's role when rewriting the history. Freeman continued, noting that as late as 1988, the assertion by theologian Richard Hansen in his book The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God, that emperors played the primary role in establishing orthodoxy was labeled provocative despite being supported by a mass of historical evidence. The foundations of medieval papal authority had been laid leading up to Gregory, and for the next thousand years, Western European Christians accepted the notions of Roman authority that had emerged from the lies, forgeries, and declarations of primacy. Fiction had become fact, and Freeman notes that Vatican propaganda was so successful in erasing the role of the Greeks in early Christianity that many Western Christians still believed this sanitized version, and examples can still be found of how the Eastern Christians broke away from the authority of Rome, such as we saw in the CNN video. In the next video, we will trace the origins of the Papal States and the beginnings of the universal Papal monarchy that would crown and depose, or try to, kings and emperors. If you like my content, please like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. Please also consider supporting my work by becoming a Patreon sponsor. You can also find me on the following platforms.